Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Dead Wrong, the podcast. My name is Elizabeth, but you can call me Liz, and I'll be your host. Today we'll be talking about a 26-year-old cold case. Keep listening for a deep dive into the unsolved murder of five-year-old Amanda Doherty. Today's episode takes us to the Sunshine State. We're looking at North Lauderdale, Florida. And our story starts on the night of September 21st, 1994. It's around 10 p.m. when Amanda Doherty is tucked into bed by her mother and father, Lori and David. Somewhere between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. that same night, Lori checks on Amanda one more time before she makes her own way to bed. At 2.30 a.m., there are several neighbors who report to have seen the front door of the Doherty home wide open. And there are two family pit bulls roaming around on the front lawn with no sign of Lori or David. The family's two pit bulls have yet to be described as aggressive or violent. However, it's important to note that whoever was able to get in and out of the house would have had to get past the two pit bulls without alarming them. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a proud dog mom and hopefully there are some dog parents listening. My two small dogs go crazy at the sound of the slightest whisper. When profiling this perpetrator, it's possible that they were a friend of the Doherty's or even one of the Doherty's, comfortable enough around the two pit bulls to make it past them unscathed. Back to our timeline. It's 2.30 a.m. when these neighbors report seeing the front door wide open and the pit bulls kind of just hanging out on the front lawn. The next mark in our timeline comes at 6 a.m., just three and a half hours later when David and his son, Amanda's brother, wake up to get their morning started. It's now September 22nd, 1994. They wake up to find the front door wide open and Amanda nowhere to be found. A half hour later at 6.30 a.m., Amanda is officially reported missing to North Lauderdale Police. Dozens of police officers, firefighters, volunteers, and family members gather to canvas the area and search for the missing girl. Their search comes to a screeching halt on September 24th, 1994, just two days later, at 2 p.m., when a jogger spots a body face down in six inches of water. Amanda's body was found roughly 28 miles north of North Lauderdale. For those of you unfamiliar with Florida, North Lauderdale is located in Broward County. Broward County is sandwiched in between Miami-Dade County to the south and Palm Beach County to the north. So Amanda lived in Broward County, but her body was found in Palm Beach County near the Boca Raton area. Upon discovery, Amanda was naked aside from a blue and white electrical wire that was still wrapped around her neck. There were no signs of defensive wounds and no sign of sexual assault. The Palm Beach County Medical Examiner said Amanda had been dead for three days by the time they were able to do an autopsy. What's important to take away from that is that the three days fits within the timeline we've established so far but it tells us something key about the perpetrator. It tells us the perpetrator wasted little to no time. Did the perpetrator always intend to murder Amanda? Or did something go wrong that caused the perp to murder Amanda way sooner than he initially thought he would? Or was that never the plan? 
The examiner ruled that the official cause of death was ligature strangulation. Ligature strangulation is strangulation with the use of an object, such as wire, a rope, or even shoelaces, using that object to wrap around either part of or the entirety of the neck. So I know you're probably asking yourself if there was any evidence in the canal or even the surrounding area, or what about the house? I mean, the door was wide open. The perpetrator had to get in and out of the house. How would they have managed to not leave anything behind? Was it because they were a skilled criminal? Or was it because they knew the inside of the home? That there wasn't any evidence I could find. Remember, even though this case is 26 years old, it's still an open investigation and police have to stay tight-lipped about the small amount of evidence that they might have so as not to compromise the investigation. From what I read, there was no evidence found, aside from the blue and white electrical wire still wrapped around Amanda's neck. However, there is a key player in this investigation that I haven't mentioned. Stephen Covell. According to an article published in the Sun Sentinel in late 2000, Stephen Covell was actually a school friend of David's, and he lived briefly with the Doherty family two years prior to Amanda's abduction and murder. Lori and David actually asked Stephen to move out because he was abusing drugs and stealing from them. Per Lori, which you can find this statement in the article, Lori says Stephen hated Amanda and threatened both herself and her husband. I don't know what kind of person feels the need to hate a three-year-old, which is how old Amanda would have been at the time, but it's something to keep in mind. Apparently there was an incident in the Doherty home where Stephen brought sex toys into the home and Amanda, being the curious three-year-old toddler that she was, uncovered them. Stephen had previously worked as a painter at an apartment complex that is said to be close to the canal where Amanda's body was found. This detail I've learned to take with a grain of salt. It was mentioned in one article and there's no details surrounding what the actual distance was between this apartment complex and the canal. This really could be pure coincidental. Moving back to the pit bulls, it's noted that Stephen was so comfortable with the two dogs that he actually slept with them occasionally when he slept on the couch while he was living with the Doherty's. Law enforcement has indicated that Stephen was interviewed several times, but there was never enough to charge him for or in connection with Amanda's abduction or the murder. They do, however, hold the belief that whoever took Amanda had to have been familiar enough with the pit bulls to evade any sort of commotion that night. It's clear that the neighbors in that area were alert and aware and picked up on anything weird that might have been happening. They reported seeing the door open. They reported seeing the pit bulls on the front lawn. They would have reported hearing a mild commotion caused by the dogs. Lori's aunt, Marie Kundari, said Stephen was the only family friend who did not volunteer to look for the child when she was reported missing. Lori and their neighbors reported seeing him removing the carpet from his van and washing out the vehicle shortly after Amanda's death. There's two things there. Why did Stephen feel the need to evade police during a massive search for his school friend's daughter? Is it because he was abusing drugs and potentially had drugs on him and may have had, you know, a slight criminal record and didn't want to cause any trouble? It's possible. Or was it because he didn't want to get caught or linked to the murder? Now, why did all this information come out in a Sun Sentinel article in late 2000? Amanda's abduction and murder happened in 1994. So six years later, all this information about her case and Stephen Cavell's connection was suddenly resurfacing. 
And this was because in 2000, Stephen Covell was wanted for robbing at least six banks in both Broward and Palm Beach counties. These robberies earned him the name of Big Boy Bandit. I was unable to find any information as to what he did that earned him that name or maybe what media outlet gave it to him. Now Stephen Cavell was caught not during a bank heist as you might expect, but instead in a hot pursuit involving the abduction of a 10 year old girl. On Tuesday, November 28th, 2000, at 6.45 a.m., two sisters began their normal walk to school, just as they did every morning, when suddenly the 10-year-old girl was pulled through the open driver's side window of a van and shoved to the floor. Stephen proceeded to point a black BB gun at her. Her younger sister, who was six at the time, ran home to tell her brother about what had just happened. He, of course, called 911, and our next update happens only two hours later, at 8.45 a.m. Stephen drops the girl off outside Mersano's Glass Imports. Mersano's Glass Imports was located in Broward County. It's in a kind of industrial warehouse district. There's not a lot of foot traffic there, maybe a couple customers, mostly just business owners and technicians and workers. So he drops her off in front of the back bay garage door to this warehouse. During that two hour capture that Stephen had taken the girl, he says that he took her to a wooded area, sexually assaulted her in the van, and then dropped her off. Now three blocks away from where the young girl was dropped off, there was a police officer on duty and he caught on to Stephen's vehicle, the license plate, and slowly began trailing him. Now, in an attempt to catch Stephen and arrest him, he tried to make a routine traffic stop. However, Stephen, he sped off and actually initiated a short chase that ended when Stephen crashed into another vehicle as he was making a right hand turn. Now, when Stephen was arrested, this is what he said. He said he was on a crack cocaine binge and that he had the quote unquote urge to abduct and sexually batter the girl. This prompted law enforcement to review Amanda's case and Stephen's potential connection to it. He was re-interviewed but has not been charged in connection to Amanda's case. However, law enforcement do maintain that he has not been eliminated as a suspect and that no one has been eliminated as a suspect. No one has been eliminated. So was there more than one suspect? Yes. The main suspect was, and still is, Amanda's father, David Doherty. David has a lengthy criminal record. It highlights his history and relationship with violence. During the initial investigation, David failed both a polygraph test and a voice stress test. Now, a voice stress test is similar to a polygraph, but it measures the amount of stress in your voice when you're asked a series of questions. As of 2000, David was reported to have nine felony convictions. And some of those include a guilty charge of manslaughter, in the death of a friend run over by a motorcycle at the age of 17. For this, David was given two years of probation. In 93, he was charged with battery on his 72-year-old grandmother, who was battling cancer at the time. For this, David received five years probation. And most recently, in 2000, David faced charges of aggravated assault and domestic battery after he choked and threw his wife Lori to the ground in front of North Lauderdale police officers. He then proceeded to wave his pistol around 
in front of the officers. This was the latest information I was able to find surrounding David's criminal record and history and his recent whereabouts. But it's very clear from his criminal record that David is capable of this kind of violence. Could he have abducted and murdered his own daughter? The answer is still unclear. David insists that he had absolutely nothing to do with the disappearance or the murder of his daughter. But we have to consider that in the disappearance or murder of a child, the parents are almost always the first and main suspect. It's simply much more likely that a mother, a father, or even a close family member would commit the crime than a stranger. We discussed how upon discovery, Amanda showed no signs of sexual assault. This is crucial in building a profile for the perpetrator. Remember when Stephen Covell was caught? He said he had the urge to kidnap and rape the girl. Sex offenders are often battling mental illness or drug addiction or a myriad of influences that cause them to feel the need or urge to offend. If Amanda's perpetrator was a sex offender like Stephen, he wouldn't have been able to help himself. While I was gathering research on this case, I stumbled across an odd online forum. The web address was kidnappingmurderandmayhem.blogspot.com. The address directed me to a forum titled, Did the Big Boy Bandit Murder Mandy Doherty? The date at the top of the forum was September 9th, 2008, nearly 12 years old. The initial post that began the thread simply stated the circumstances surrounding Amanda's disappearance and her murder and pleaded for help in solving the cold case. There are 33 comments and I implore you to read through all of them, but today I'll just be covering the few that stood out to me and that I believe to be instrumental in laying out the foundation of this case. The first comment in the thread was posted on December 6, 2008 by a user named Corvette and read as follows. I worked with Lori. We put out flyers looking for Amanda. I was at the funeral standing behind Lori and David. I think he's the prime suspect. She came to work many times, bruised and hurt. He told her the entire funeral to shut up, and his son. I went to their house the next day after Amanda's body was recovered, and there is no way anyone could have come to that house without a severe greeting from the pit bulls. I was there. No one can tell me any different. I just hope by now for her and her son's sake, she has left this dirt bag. P.S. David had many relations with other girls at the club, which caused Lori to get upset seeing as how she paid all the bills. And David had relations in front of Lori. He wanted multiple girls. Okay, so let's unpack this. It's impossible to verify the validity of this comment or any of the comments we're going to discuss. But it seems like there could be some truth to this one. Given the incident in 2000 between David and his wife, violence is not new to him or their relationship. It's very possible that Lori was abused on more than one occasion. Let's continue. The next user goes by the name Mandy's aunt. This user has made several comments on the thread claiming to be Amanda's aunt. It is unclear if this is, in fact, Marie Kundari, but it seems that she is claiming to be her. She first posted to the thread on February 26, 2009, in response to user Corvette's initial comment. It reads, Corvette, I don't know who you are, but I am Mandy's aunt. I was at their home about one hour after they found her missing. Not many people like David, but have you kept up with the news? Steve Cavell, who has also been a prime suspect, you would know who he is if you know the family, is currently serving three life sentences for abducting and molesting a lovely young girl. 
He is also an alleged suspect in the abduction of a three-year-old. By the way, they also found him to be the big boy bandit bank robber. Okay, so far this is all information we know. All of this is information that has been made available to the public through several news outlets. So we can verify the validity, but this user is also not giving us anything that we haven't heard previously. The following day, the same user, Mandy's aunt, comments yet again. Every year around the anniversary of Mandy's death, the family will get a call from the investigators who have worked on this case. From what we have been told, it seems that Cavell is the prime suspect, especially since he abducted the little Pompano girl. That is what he is serving three life sentences for. Myself and some of Mandy's family members went to the trial for this little girl as observers, and we were there when the judge sentenced him. The judge said words to the effect that the only way Covell would get out of jail was in a pine box. Covell showed no remorse and knew some of us from Mandy's family were there. He didn't even look at us once. As for knowing the truth, we have been told so many stories by the investigators and police, we don't know what to believe anymore. They have told us they believe it was Cavell. Why? He's obviously a child molester. It would have been very easy for Mandy to identify him, so it was easier for him to end her life than risk the chance of Mandy ratting him out. He was also thrown out of the house for repeated drug abuse and theft. We have mourned Mandy for nearly 15 years. You never have closure. There is no such thing as closure. We are a large family and very close. Not one of us will ever be the same after this tragedy. Okay, just to quickly clarify, the little Pompano girl that this user mentions in their comment is the 10 year old girl that we talked about earlier that Stephen Cabell abducted and raped back in 2000. What I found important here was how the user mentions, they have told us they believe it was Covell. Why? He's obviously a child molester. Again, we talked about this in the beginning. He's obviously a child molester, but if he had a five-year-old within his capture, he simply wouldn't have been able to help himself. And what we know from media and news outlets, what has been provided to us by the police is that she was not sexually assaulted. But we do have to go back to even though this is a 26-year-old cold case, it's still technically an open investigation. So police do need to hold on to whatever little bit of evidence they have so as not to compromise their investigation. And that takes us to this next comment. The following day, now February 28th, 2009, user Mandy's aunt comments once again, with information I have been unable to find anywhere else. And the comment reads, originally we were told she had not been sexually attacked. As time went on, police eventually told us that she had been. I asked why we were not told this from the start. The investigators said it would have compromised their investigation. Okay, major news in that comment. Back to the validity. If this user is, in fact, Mandy's aunt, and if what this user is saying is true, this could completely change the dynamic of the case. If Amanda was sexually assaulted, it is incredibly probable that Stephen Covell is the perpetrator. Did he only let the 10-year-old girl go because she wouldn't be able to identify him? Did he murder Amanda because she knew him too well? But let's continue down the rabbit hole that is this archived forum. Jumping ahead a few years, on April 4th, 2011, a user by the name Donna commented the following. I too am greatly interested in this case for the fact that David was found guilty of manslaughter for the death of my cousin, Glenn Allen, in 1984. I also thought David was guilty of this. It seems like what the user Donna is referring to at the end of this comment by saying, I also thought David was guilty of this, is Amanda's disappearance and abduction. 
So we've now, you know, we've seen some comments from Mandy's aunt who could possibly be Marie Kundari insinuating that Stephen Colvell is the guy. Now we've got a comment indicating it could potentially be David. Now the manslaughter that the user Donna mentions is probably the manslaughter that David served two years probation for when he was 17. I attempted to find some sort of media coverage, news articles, or even court records on the incident using the name Glenn Allen um, that Donna used in her comment, but I was unsuccessful. But I think it's important to point out that we're seeing users argue from both sides. Users who believe it was David and now users who believe it was Stephen. On August 21st, 2011, there's an interesting comment that was posted. It's a little cryptic. It's littered with misspellings and bad grammar. However, it contains information that is not said in any of the other comments, so it kind of stuck out to me. So I'm going to read that one to you. It says, I have known David for over 20 years. If only someone would listen to what I know, Mandy may be able to rest. Does anyone know that my ex-wife got the flyers out there with the help of others and that my brother-in-law was the head FBI agent in charge at the Winn-Dixie? That Steve Covell showed up the second day in a spotlessly clean van still dripping wet? Or that I was one of the few that could get by the dogs as I let Dave's dog breed with mine? Damn short-term memory loss makes me forget their names right now. Or it could be the fact I heard that David died yesterday. Why have neither one of Mandy's parents visited her grave? Guilt? Come on, Lori. You know what Jason's friends were doing. Hell, she was just like you. All her dance moves, very inappropriate. Did you forget about all the wild parties you threw? I know more than anyone. Dave told me things he wouldn't tell anyone. Time to tell the truth. Okay, a few things here. So this user kind of nonchalantly mentions that David might be dead. Again, something I was unable to substantiate. I looked through obituaries recent within that year that the comment was posted. I didn't find anything. That doesn't mean that's not true, but I couldn't find anything to substantiate the claim. My other point to that kind of slight mention of his death is this person claims to be so close to David that David told him things that he wouldn't tell anyone else. I believe, and it's my opinion, that if David was close enough to this person to tell him his deepest, darkest, darkest secrets, I'd like to think that he would be one of the first to be notified of David's death in a more formal way than posting on a random forum that he might be dead. That's my take on that. This isn't the first time that we hear, you know, about Stephen Covell's van being cleaned. We've got very watchful neighbors that reported seeing him rip out the carpet, deep clean the interior and exterior. So this is something that's kind of known that happened shortly after her disappearance. What I found most interesting was the mention of the wild parties and the inappropriate dancing that he's claiming Amanda did. So it's something that I wasn't able to find anywhere else. We know that Stephen was abusing drugs. He had a slight criminal record. And we know that he brought sex toys into the home while he was living there. So it's unknown, you know, if David and Lori did drugs with Stephen. These parties that they were hosting were, you know, drug deals or drug parties, or if it was cocaine or marijuana or whatever it was. But this user's comment, what I took away from it, and I think that it's open for interpretation, I took away that the user's kind of insinuating that the Doherty's were holding sex or drug-like parties and in some way involving their daughter, who would have been five at the time. Moving right along, the next post is by a user that goes by the name Neighbor1. And they posted the following. Before I read the comment, this comment was incredibly well written, it was very organized, and what they have to say really substantiates a lot of what other people have said. My family and I were neighbors to these people. My daughter was about the same age as Amanda, and they used to play together. I know some of you are related to them, but in my personal opinion, both of them were total whack jobs. The dude let one of his dogs get out one day, and the damn thing charged me and my kid in the driveway of my home as I was leaving for work. Then he blames me for antagonizing the dog. The way he talked to me that day, 
told me that the guy was a nutcase and I never let my kid go near them again. After Amanda went missing, I immediately suspected the father. I would constantly hear screaming and yelling from their house at all hours of the day and night when they weren't busy throwing all night loud parties. Different cars constantly coming and going all the time. Not what I would call an ideal home for young children. The guy always looked pissed off at the world and was not friendly at all. I never bought the she wandered off in the middle of the night story. I think that the moment they started searching for her, the parents already knew she was dead. This comment lends to the credibility of user Jeff Rowe because neighbor one mentions an environment of constant partying in the Doherty home, which is what Jeff Rowe touches on briefly. He mentions, you know, a loud environment, the inappropriate dance moves, the incident with the dog, it only furthers the assumption that law enforcement has continued to make in uh, front of media and through various news outlets that the perpetrator had to have known the dogs well enough to avoid causing any sort of commotion. The toxic living situation that neighbor one describes, it paints an incredibly vivid picture of habitual violence, which is what we've seen is already apparent in David's criminal record and something that he's clearly capable of. The last and most recent comment on this forum is made by a user that goes by the name Friend. And this comment was made on March 14th, 2019. That's a little over a year ago. So something that I wanted to point out was the fact that the forum, the activity on it, spans all the way from 2008 to 2019. So it's nice to see that people are engaging in conversation about a 26 year old cold case because it is still cold and it is still an active investigation and we should still be doing everything we can uh, to bring justice to this family and give them the closure that they so desperately deserve. So the comment reads, which dog came from your litter? One of the two that still were living at the house the night Mandy went missing? Or the one that was choked with construction wire for biting at one of the kids? then thrown back in the woods at the end of the street. Part of that story that is eerie is that David killed that dog that way with the same Mandy was found. And I was told it was the same wire from the van of his truck because they tested it from the same roll. Definitely made me think. I'm not sure who the user is trying to respond to in this thread, there's a lot of connections made here. There's no information on who this user is or what their connection is to David or the family. And again, this is information that I can't substantiate because it's, it isn't published anywhere in any newspaper articles or it hasn't been put out officially by police. But this, again, I mean, it takes us back to police have to hold on to whatever they can if there's only a little bit of circumstantial evidence or whatever it may be to protect the integrity of their investigation. And even though it's been 26 years, it is still an open investigation. The connection is apparent. I mean, if David did kill one of his dogs and he did kill the dog through ligature strangulation using the same wire that was used on Mandy, that is huge. I do think though, if that was the case and if police were aware of this and they had evidence to kind of substantiate it, I'm not an expert, but I think that that might've been enough to indict him or move further in the process of, you know, charging him with the crimes. There's no way to tell the validity of this user's comment, but it's the most recent update we have on Amanda Doherty's case. If you have any information on Amanda Doherty's abduction or murder, please contact Special Agent Floyd Turner of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement out of the Broward office. I will include his office address and phone number in the show notes of this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the first episode of Dead Wrong Podcast. You can follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at Dead Wrong Pod. Uh, you can find exclusive episode content on those two social media platforms like photos from today's episode and of course don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts that way you'll get notifications when i post which is every tuesday and thursday 
And if you're feeling extra kind, please don't be shy and go ahead and leave a rating or review on the podcast. That's all I've got for today and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.